smells like butter. What is that? You, uh, BTS? I you don't know? even know what BTS is, man. The K-pop sensation that's literally the world's most popular artist right now? Like, I'm not even kidding? No idea. All right. I don't know why anybody <laughs> listens to this podcast. <laughs> I don't even know BTS. Oh, now I got to Google it. All right. So yeah. anyway, we should probably fill people in on the fact that this episode, this little post episode chat is being recorded a few days after the actual chat. And during the conversation, you had to bounce a little early. So you'll hear Vishnu talking in the beginning, but then he leaves me all alone and things got way better from there <laughs> yeah what can i say the corporate life called me and the podcast got better yeah <laughs> so what'd you think man give us some takeaways what a great conversation um for those who don't know runway.ai is a video editing software that occurs entirely in the browser and uses machine learning to make video editing better and brandon dorsey our guest leads the back-end infrastructure team there uh, and it was a really cool conversation because as you can imagine, working with video for machine learning for browser level performance and low latency hard. is really hard. Yeah. And it was awesome hearing Brandon talk about it. What did you learn? Dude, I just love how versatile he is. And also like there were such good questions when you came at him with like, how do you, first of all, why did you pick browser based? That's one really important question to think about. Why not just go for an app? And his answer was brilliant. Like we wanted to make it a level playing field. So we can, you can outsource all this heavy lifting and this like beefy machine GPUs to us. And that was something that I hadn't even thought about before. Like, oh yeah, all right. So that's one. And then later on after you left, he had some really cool... Uh, just telling his story, how he came up as an artist and then got into software engineering and then got into machine learning. Actually, he got into machine learning and then he got into DevOps and software engineering and then MLOps. And so, yeah. but a huge takeaway for me, last one before I throw it back to you, was how he said that they knew they were onto something. So the company pivoted completely yeah. and they knew the company was onto something when people were willing to sit through a bad product experience because the pain was so much or like the problem they were solving was so strong so that was something that just like he it, it was like blinking lights flashing lights when he said that uh, i think his exact words were something like well people were willing to edit videos at 4 fps and mm -hmm. then they knew that they had something there. So what about you, man? I mean, I feel like you took all the good ones, but I'll try my best. <laughs> uh, you know, to all our listeners out there, we spent a lot of time talking about infrastructure, the cost of managing infrastructure, the overhead, the challenges. And, you know, you're one of two companies, I think, increasingly, in my opinion. You're either a company where infrastructure is your main bottleneck or infrastructure isn't a priority at all. And increasingly, you know, I think that is the dichotomy that we're starting to see. I work at a company, I work at a healthcare company. Uh, and for us, cloud infrastructure is completely something to be abstracted away. It's not strategic. It's not core to the value of our business at all. But for something like Runway ML and what Brandon does, infrastructure is highly strategic. And I think for a long time, we've been living in this world where like, People talked so much about infrastructure because it's a problem everybody had to varying degrees. And now with the advent of new MLOps tools, infrastructure tooling, we're starting to see a bimodal shift. Either infrastructure matters or it doesn't. And I think if you decide upfront which of those you belong to, the more cost and the more work you'll save yourself in the long run. Ooh, that was insightful. I was not expecting that at all. And <laughs> I may have to steal that. Uh, I'm going to use it for the next talk I got to give. <laughs> coming up as long as you credit me yeah uh, we'll see. or it's actually as long as you listen to bts after this episode you go <laughs> check out what bts is oh i'm excited for this i've got some homework to do over the weekend so let's kick it off with brandon before we do i must mention that there is the apply conference coming up 
I'm going to be stealing all of Vishnu's wisdom and giving a talk there. Also, I'll be hosting it and the MC again, uh, which still amazes me that I haven't been fired yet. That's all. Like, you can sign up for that in the description below. Come check it out. It's going to be a ball. I'll probably be doing a little improvised guitar playing and maybe some guided meditation. Uh, all the fun stuff. There, there will be a lot of talks, too, on MLOps and specifically, like, the... I mean, there's just huge names. Anyway, check it out. Look at the speakers and let's get into this conversation. First off, Brandon, thanks again. Yeah, no, I thank you. I thanked you before, but I'm gonna thank you again for joining us. You're joining us from Runway ML, which I took a look at the website. So just everyone take a look at the website. Coolest product in the world. Let's start. Can you tell us what Runway 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 ML is? What the product is, and and what you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Runway is a video editor um, that runs on the web that harnesses different machine learning technologies behind the scene to kind of like develop. Uh, provide a, a new experience for video editors. Um, so basically using um, the web browser as the stage sort of to um, perform normal linear video editing techniques, but then we also provide certain like specialized tools um, where users can uh, kind of like harness some harness some machine learning capabilities to perform like automate tasks or to uh, to kind of like beef up their video editing on our remote server infrastructure. So um, the, the browser kind of like allows a window <laughs> for us to do that. So it's, it's a way, basically it's a, it's a way for um, folks to, video editors to engage uh, with editing media in, in new ways. That is, it's really cool. And just so I understand, is this, is this a replacement for iMovie or like some of the other stuff that I've seen? Like, what is the use case around like video editing you guys are trying to power? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's everyone ideally, but we're okay. especially targeting kind of like prosumers and, um, and a lot of folks that are, are making media that didn't used to be making media 10 years ago or making videos 10 years ago. So we, we care a lot about professional video editors, but we're also really interested in the space of like that, that TikTok has created or that, mm. um, that these these like quick form um, uh, video sharing on social media has created, and so it's we're targeting like users who maybe maybe I maybe they know iMovie, but they sure. certainly might not know Premiere. Um, mm -hmm. They certainly mm -hmm. don't have like a real hardcore relationship with a video editor yet, um, and and um, we we sort of feel like we can um, provide a, an experience that is that is new to them um, and also uh, allows them to kind of do things that they weren't able to do. So we have this this tool called Green Screen, which okay. is like a rotoscoping tool. Um, and that allows you to do, uh, to kind of like cut out uh, images from a video and then uh, like cut out a person per se. And uh -huh. then you could kind of like apply that, um, that cut out temporally across a whole video so something that would have taken like five hours maybe now takes yeah. five minutes and that's kind of like we're building a tool that's going to allow video editors of all types to do that um and and so we're really excited to see who's using it yeah in a way it's got it. it's got rethinking it. the whole idea of how you create videos and you don't have to be bound to what it was when you were having to come at it from premiere or uh, or DaVinci or whatever it is. So now, uh, I've got one for you. Like the question I have around this is what are the machine learning use cases that you have with this tool, right? It seems like the green screen is probably one of them to take out, like cut out the main image or the, what do they call it? Um, in, in film, they call it something uh, uh, talent, Rotoscoping, right? <laughs> perhaps. Uh, oh, yeah. cut out talent. Yeah. Yeah. Where you cut out talent. <laughs> I'm trying to act cool. Uh, with the little lingo that I know, uh, from <laughs> spending a weekend in LA. So basically, yeah. What, what are some other ML use cases though? Because I know you're using a lot of them and then we can dive under the hood of like how you're actually serving these models up. Yeah, absolutely. So, so green screen is maybe like was sort of our breakout 
um, product. Uh, we also um, have a tool called InPainting, which allows you to kind of, it's almost like a content aware fill, but that works over video. Um, you can think about it like a t temporal aware content fill. Um, so anything you take out with green screen, you can kind of replace what it was. Um, and then we also do, we're branching into more support for audio. So things like one click clean audio. So for instance, in like a, a talking head video or like a, um, an interview, you could kind of just like upload your media, click one button and it sounds crisp. So do you guys have these really cool applications of machine learning and video? And you're taking it to consumers who, for whom things like Premiere, like I haven't even heard of Premiere, but the TikTok star who wants to do something cool with their video and doesn't want to like install a, a big sort of software, you know, yeah, installation. You, that's what you're solving. And you were telling us originally that somehow this vision for this product emerged out of a model zoo product. And, you know, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because I did see a couple blog posts when I was reading through your engineering blog where it seemed like you guys were allowing anyone to deploy any kind of model into a video editor, but those features were deprecated. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about the journey of, you know, starting as a model zoo and now going to this really cool sort of in-browser video editor? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So um, Runway is a company of about 30 people. I, I manage the backend team, which as of yesterday is three of us. Um, so we're still a really small, like, uh, quick moving startup. But we've been around for about three and a half years. Um, and rewind the clock, maybe two years, we were a really, really small startup. There was just a handful of us. Um, and we were building kind of what feels like a, a totally different product from what we have today. Um, and just like you said, it was basically this model zoo. So it was a way for, um, we were kind of targeting creatives of all types to use machine learning algorithms without needing to know how to code. Um, or without needing to have been read the latest papers. Um, so the idea is basically we could kind of like containerize um, these PyTorch or, or TensorFlow models and provide like a standard interface to them. Um, so we were mainly dealing with image-based models and it was a desktop app <laughs> that folks could download um, and, and could uh, kind of like run these different models and include them in some way in their artistic practice. Um, and we found that was like such a fun product to build, but we couldn't get away from this feeling that we were just making a demo app. That's at least how I felt about it. Like we had all these cool, um, cool models that folks could use. We literally supported over like a hundred different machine learning models. Um, and you could just download this app and you could pay to run the compute on our GPU infrastructure, or you could just run it for free if you had your own GPU. Um, our users loved it. We really enjoyed building it, but we didn't really ever break out of like, this is a fun tool. Like, look what you can do with ML today to like, this is an actual use case that is like, I'm a professional and it is changing the way that I practice my profession. Um, so, at, at back in the day, we were kind of just like pick, picking a model off a shelf, kind of wrapping it up, putting it inside of our, our app so that our users could use it, and then seeing what they did with it, and then kind of repeating that cycle. And about a year and a half ago, our team kind of just decided to break that cycle, and, and we kind of asked the question, like, well, what if instead of working in this way, we, uh, we instead just like found one model, one use case, which we decided would be rotoscoping. And the whole team just like poured our resources into making the best rotoscoping experience. Um, back then it was also still in a desktop. It, I believe it wasn't uh, in the web yet. Um, and that kind of like the response to that totally changed how we decided to continue building our product and, and moving the company forward. So we, we found that like, we were engaging with folks that knew nothing about ML and honestly didn't really even care like ML or AI sounds cool, but they really just wanted to, to edit their videos faster. Um, Wait, why we rotoscoping? Found, like, because we thought we could do it better than any tool out there. Um, that was kind of our pitch. Like we, 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 we were working on some models internally um, and we were really 
pleased with the performance and we really had never seen anything where you could take a single frame edit it and then have that change propagate across like a three minute video and we knew that like rotoscoping is this really manual process um that if we could if we could do something that you know had pretty good performance uh worked quickly but then also produced a really nice looking result that people might actually use it um so that was kind of our bet and so far we kind of haven't looked back we've we've continued to be building video editing tools like we've mm -hmm. built an entire linear video editor in the web we made a big bet on the web that um you know historically folks edit video on these like big boxes big desktop boxes at home Macros. or the studio you like have this really heavy footage that you have to kind of like lug around in big hard drives um the tools for collaboration really aren't great we kind of made this bet that like the web browser is the is the place where the next generation of video editing will happen um so we've been solving all sorts of challenges around that um the idea that like a goal one a goal of ours internally is kind of like we want you to be able to edit your videos at the park <laughs> you know um that's sick uh, okay so i want to get into some of the engineering challenges around this and let me start first with can you tell us a little bit more about like what kind of models you guys are running like you know what the intensity of those models just kind of curious you know i think we've had on people before that told us you know for some of the applications that they use that you know frankly uh, they use very simple machine learning models but they do a lot of intensive feature computation right and that shapes their engineering sort of trade-offs um in your case what kind of sort of machine learning models are you running on these video clips that people are uploading to your to your editor yeah, so we do we do a lot of model inference on the fly, and I think that is one of the biggest engineering challenges about building a tool like green screen that does this like temporal mask propagation at its core, basically. Um, and aside from that, that also this idea of like doing on the fly model inference on video is like a core part of our engineering challenges it exists for video but it also it exists for green screen but it also exists for all of the other video models that we're currently building um we we exist in a, in an environment where a user will like upload a video to object store we will shove it in object storage and then they'll immediately want to play it back but with some effect on it and so in a way we kind of have a um a scenario that looks a lot like video on demand services so something like netflix or something where like the media exists and we just want to stream it back to your browser but in a way it's like totally divorced from that because it's not static media it's media that exists in some object storage we want to get it to your browser as quickly as possible but we want to perform all these complex operations on it right and we have to do that while racing a playhead basically like a user is going to want to apply an effect and then press the space bar and watch that media playback before that media even really exists in the way that, that we think about it um and so i think that's like a core engineering challenge for us is like how do we build a pipeline that can fetch media um that can decode that compressed media that's good for storage and good for transit into a stack of like numpy frames how can we then run our models on batches of num numpy frames as quickly as possible re-encode it um stream it back to a user's browser and then like do that over and over and over again because oftentimes like they'll want to make a change or something so we really operate on this like human in the loop kind of approach to ml where we don't just take a model that we don't build a model or take a model that has like top performance given some benchmark we're really interested in like users providing feedback on the performance um so like a, a user will will like kind of make an edit see how it affects the media and then make a new edit so it's kind of like you have this feedback loop um and that behind the scenes is a lot of computation um and it's a really challenging thing to do um well with a lot of concurrent users and so that's that's one of our um our biggest challenges i'd say is like how do we balance just this like heavy compute really spiky um traffic patterns <laughs> Um, and also deliver this this user experience that feels really good, is reliable. Um. Sheesh. Yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> I feel like there's so many directions that you could go in terms of asking questions about this that I'm, I'm feeling that. I don't know about you, Demetrios, but, you know, let me start with perhaps the most basic part of this, which is video, right? A lot of the people that we talk to tend to work with logs, text, images, mm -hmm. you know, uh, pretty standard forms of unstructured data that, uh, or structured data that, uh, you know, we have a pretty good handle on in the deep learning world, right? Yeah. Um, because I'm assuming that you guys are using deep learning models here. Yep, um, a lot of times, yeah. And you mentioned some of the challenges of working with video. Uh, you know, the size, the compression, decompression, the fact that perhaps some of the, some of the Python-based utilities you might be using aren't as uh, effective as working at, in terms of like working with the video at scale. I'm curious from your standpoint, how do you think about performance latency? Like how do you derive your requirements um, in the context of like such a challenging data format and then meet them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's really complex. I didn't know until about a year and a half ago in the past year and a half experience I've had just how hard video is like, right? It's not, just like you say, it's like not like normal tabular data. It's not like I have this pretty, <laughs> these, these, pretty values that I can just like feed into a model and get other pretty values. It's like really messy. It's hard to test because it's really qualitative. I can't um, even imagine. A lot of times we define our, our like metrics and our goals kind of at the user experience level. Um, so if we want to build a editor where you can make a change and then immediately see it applied, there's like some attention window, some small attention window that we have to be able to perform all of our compute in to provide a good user experience. So that's kind of our our metric that we use to guide everything else. And of course we have like good observability in our compute cluster and we've built like these complex queuing systems so that we can hopefully <laughs> deliver the best user experience. And we monitor all of those things, but ultimately like the golden metric is response time to users um, and user experience in, when using the app. And so that's where we set our targets kind of. And we say like, hey, we want P95 latency to be under X when using this tool. And we've come a really long way. Like when we started, when green screen was first released, I wanna say it maxed out at four FPS. Like it was almost unusable, but the user reaction to it was so good that we really were like, oh, maybe we found something here. Like if folks are willing to edit video at four FPS, and, and they're like, wow, this is totally changing my workflow, then that's something we can optimize. And that's something we can provide. If, if that's the kind of um, baseline, uh, then we have a lot of room to run. And, and we've made a lot of really awesome improvements. It's still really difficult. And every time we bring a new model into the equation, we have to kind of like tweak our system a bit. One of the thing you, things you mentioned was the challenge of testing video of because of the qualitative nature of mm -hmm. it. You know, I think back when I'm thinking about your infrastructure here and your, the way you're designing your solution, I'm thinking back to my experience working with images a lot, right? And a lot of times you're just saying, um, okay, you know, the input to this TensorFlow model or whatever it is, it's like a 256 by 256 by three, you know, uh, uh, the... I forget the word. I, I mean, I can't, the word is literally escaping. Co color, me. color. <laughs> yeah. Uh, bit depth. Cube. cube, cube, cube. I don't know. Cube. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Uh -huh. Three uh -huh. by three cube. Right. Um, just so our listeners get a sense of what, and I get a sense of what it is that you're working with in terms of like data format. What is, mm -hmm. what is the runway model literally seeing? What is it? What is it getting as an input? Yeah. Add add one more dimension for time, and that's okay. pretty much what it's seeing. Okay. Um. And so, yeah, to that idea where you're like two, it's it's generally much bigger than two fifty six by two fifty six. It's generally yeah. like nineteen eighty by uh, nineteen twenty by ten eighty or four K, um, and then wow. three channels for color, and then add another channel for time, basically. Um, yeah, and and that that stack of frames <laughs> is what I like to call it. it's. Uh, is what our models operate on generally. And then they'll, of course, do, there can be transformations where, like, if they want to work in the, um, in, in a domain that isn't the, like, RGB and, uh, XY domain, we, we at least start from that. And then you can do something like work in a, a frequency domain or something. 
Um, but that's that's what our, the entry point to most all of our models is like pile of frames, run operation, another pile of frames. Um, even if that oper you can even think of that as like an identity function, right? Where it's just going to bring in video and then produce video untouched. Um, and then you have a, a decoder at the top of that and an encoder at the bottom. And that's our mm. most simple model in a sense. It's like the model that, that does nothing but streams video. <laughs> So I'm wondering, why did you choose to go the route of hosting it in the browser and not just have something that would be a native application that you could download and presumably get a little bit more squeeze out of? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. Um, and it's a question that we're still answering, but I think our, the prospects of why build Runway in the browser is a really interesting one. Um, and I, I think it has a couple advantages. One, barrier to entry, right? Like, if you can be using a tool just because you followed a link and then, you know, five seconds later you're already using it, you had no overhead of, like, really even learning what this was, finding out how to downloading it, download it, wait a couple of, of seconds depending on your network connection and then, like, open up this desktop app, which, like, doesn't sound like a big barrier, but when you're competing with so many other, like where you're competing for attention, it kind of is. Um, so th that's one I would say is barrier to entry. Another is collaboration. Um, I think we now live in a world where like Google Docs exists on the web in such a natural way that we almost forget that there was <laughs> another way of doing it, right? Um, and I think like the web is just like, and the browser is such a good medium for collaborating. And we've never really seen a video editing tool that has the kinds of collaboration features that we're hoping, that we're building and, and releasing. Um, so that's one. Um, I also think this idea of being able to share media that, like, keeping video media local to device goes kind of against those ideas of collaboration. Um, so a big part of what makes Runway work so well in a video editing flow, I think, is the fact that we quickly upload media to um, to cloud storage, and then it can be accessible from any device. Um, and that also then makes that of media available to other people, right? You don't really have that like classic missing, <laughs> missing media uh, error message that you might be familiar with if you use something like Premiere, um, because you upload media once, and then it mm -hmm. is forever accessible um, by anyone else who wants to use it in the future, no matter how powerful their device is. Um, another thing that we experienced when we were first building Runway is like, we noticed some people had really beefy <laughs> machines that could run um, uh, run the type of model in a similar way that, that we would, would in our, our, cloud, our GPUs, our cloud GPUs. Um, but that was really rare. Even of the like power users, only about like 2% of people had the hardware that could compete with what we were using in the cloud. So this idea of like, if we offload a lot of the hard parts, like from a processing perspective, um, then we also just make mm. this tool available to way more people than it would yeah. have been uh, previously. And so we have this idea kind of that like, we want to appeal to the lowest common denominator Mm. edge hardware <laughs> edge hardware meaning i guess in this case users right. um because it allows us to it it does two things one it like means more users can use the product but it also means that we're constantly aware of user experience when people have devices that are like worse than our really nice macbooks that we develop on right so like we yeah. have this idea that like we want our um product to run great on a chromebook from five years ago so that that piece right there of abstracting away hardware, which is such a crucial component of scaling machine learning to seven billion people, is just doesn't matter what hardware it is. We're gonna get you the the the, the solution, the answer from the cloud where this model is running. I want to dive deeper into that because, you know, I think I can imagine you guys are dealing with such beefy payloads. You guys are trying to do very complex operations on them numerically and then you're trying to get them to people very quickly how do you guys not get destroyed by your aws costs or spend all your day 
just managing infrastructure? Like, how do you guys, with a team of three, you mentioned, like, yeah. how do you have such a scalable approach to managing your backend infrastructure? You know, this is a great question. <laughs> this is, a, I think, and there's no so, silver bullet, bullet answer. <laughs> I wish I could be like, uh, you know, here's, here's the top three tricks that we use and they'll work for your team. I think we've always been a pretty, like, infrastructure first company from our talent from like the people that um that that i work with yes we're a very small team but we're also like the the co-founders of the company um are super technical uh we've always taken this we've always had these hard challenges right we came from a company uh, that was building a model zoo run making it so that any model can run on on your infrastructure is a challenging problem that we actually solved pretty early in the life cycle of the company i'd say and so that kind of like gives us these affordances where like believe it or not it's actually way easier to run three or four models developed in-house at scale than it was to run 150 models from 150 different authors um so in a way like it does sound like a really challenging problem and it truly is and like cloud cost is a real thing that we're always optimizing but it's also like we the product has led us in this um direction where we're actually doing a better job of it than we ever have before because we kind of solved a lot of these issues early on. And saying we solved them is probably giving us too much credit. We learned to live with them, uh, improved our experience with them, um, made everything yeah. better in that approach. I don't think it's a solved problem. It's, it's one of the biggest problems that, that we deal with. And then the other thing that, like, from a perspective of managing um, an engineering team, we can only put so much effort on that, right? Like if, if what we want to do is, um, what we're trying to optimize for is like end user experience, then there's some amount of like suboptimal backend system that we just have to be comfortable with because we want to optimize for, um, for user experience. And so it's, it's really like a balance, um, a tug, a push and a pull. Yeah. And I know that, you did mention before that Kubernetes is your friend. And as somebody who <laughs> yeah. is in the community and I feel like it comes up at least once a day around how to use Kubernetes or should I be using Kubernetes uh, if it's overkill for my use case, that kind of question, you seem to have harnessed it. Is that, does that play into this? Like your backend infrastructure and then as soon as you start throwing kubernetes into it you were talking about like it is a lot of complexity but you need that kind of complexity if you're mm -hmm. going to be trying to solve these problems i really think that is true yeah i i think kubernetes is like a widely adopted cloud uh, container orchestration tool that really in the last like five or six years has exploded and there's a lot of differing opinions on it and you have the you, a, a, a voice that i totally respect um, oftentimes says, you know, Kubernetes is way too much, way too complex. It, to, it just divorces itself from, like, the Unix style of, like, do something small and do something well. Um, and it's kind of like a beast, right? It's unwieldy. Um, I have not found that to be the case. I mean, it is incredibly complex. I've found that it adds a ton of value. And a lot. one of the reasons that it's so complex is that, like, the territory is so complex. The territory of, like managing um, stateless and stateful applications in the cloud in a fault tolerant way and in a way that is like um, well behaved in receiving like potentially hundreds of updates a day it's a really complex beast <laughs> auto scaling just if yeah. you take the if you just like look at a really minute problem that kubernetes helps solve which is auto scaling um, that itself is like so complex but Kubernetes provides these really good interfaces to it. I really like the like level of abstraction that you work in in Kubernetes as well. You think of these workloads as um, as like these units that can fit into each other and behaviors can be applied on them in a systematic way that once Kubernetes clicks, it really just is helpful in my opinion. Hmm. Um, I think I, another thing that I really love about Kubernetes, if you do it well, um, is this like declarative infrastructure. So we really try hard not to make any Kubernetes changes on the fly, like live to our running infrastructure. We make it all in like code repositories and then we apply the state uh, that's described in those code repos repositories to our infrastructure. Um, and that makes like 
reasoning about what is running and what should be running and why it's running in that way is really good because you can like almost like follow the history of how the infrastructure got there. Um, so you can see like if you look at a certain piece of running infrastructure and it has a value you maybe don't understand, you can link it to a PR that hopefully has a, a good description of, of why that change was made. Um, I'm probably getting a little bit too much in the weeds, but I really believe that like Kubernetes is a beast, but so is the territory. Um, yeah. And we've found it to be to be really helpful. Well, there is something that you mentioned too, which is like statelessness is your friend. And maybe you can go over that mm -hmm. a little bit because I, uh, I actually was part of a community uh, almost two years ago now that was called Data on Kubernetes. And it was all about doing stateful workloads on Kubernetes. And the whole thing was like, it, there's this question around, should you be running stateful workloads on Kubernetes? Is it ready for that yet? Is it not? It sounds yeah. like you do it, but whenever you can mm -hmm. avoid it, you try to do and avoid that. Is that my yeah. Uh, understanding? Yeah, so what I really like... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, what, what I've found, what we found as a pattern that works really well is to make your workloads themselves, the, the pods, basically like the atomic unit of compute, be stateless, but then have stateful things that they can grab work from and do a little bit of it but then if they get interrupted we kind of like maybe reached a checkpoint and that work isn't wasted um so i i really like the idea of like keeping state out of the cluster so you could use like a managed database service like rds if your data is um fits nicely in a relational database you could use um, object storage things like that and then have your workloads kind of like assume that your workload is going to be maybe short-lived assume that it's operating in, a, in a, a volatile environment, kind of like have the first thing that it does as soon as it's alive, grab some work, start processing it the whole time, kind of like report, save checkpoints, maybe report to stateful systems its progress. Um, if it finishes, congratulations, well well done, little worker. Um, but also knowing that uh, that worker could go away and then another worker could come in. Um, that's really great because you you get like fault tolerance in your system you end up building a system that is just like more highly available but then you also get other affordances like you can um going back to the the question or uh, question about cost um there exist uh spot instance markets which are like a, w a way that like with through aws or another cloud provider you can get discounts on compute if your computer if compute instant can be preempted uh, or basically taken away with a two minute warning or less. Um, and once you've made your workloads uh, stateless and and be able to be preempted, then you can also run them a lot cheaper um, on the cloud. So that's an approach that we've that we've taken and largely found success in. Hmm. And yeah, I love it, too. I mean, it's it's highly oversimplified when you're like oh yeah it's just like when you're playing a video game and you get to that place where you can go back to where you uh you don't have to go back to the very beginning but you can start off at the level mm -hmm. that you died at or the closest checkpoint and so there's another thing that yeah. you said that i i wanted to dive into more which is merge to master quickly and i feel like that needs to be mm -hmm. on a shirt we might make a shirt out of it or something <laughs> Uh, but yeah. can you go into that and why you feel so strongly about it? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that good ML ops in a lot of ways starts with good DevOps and it's kind of an extension of DevOps. I'm partially injecting a bias because I come at a lot of engineering from this DevOps background and I find DevOps interesting and I find like the nitty gritty infrastructure parts really interesting. So that's maybe why I'm a fan of Kubernetes. Um, but I think we can borrow some of the ideas that DevOps has um, when we think about ML ops, right? And like what my team and, and my company has found to be really helpful is like, if we can create pipelines in our code authoring and engineering practices that get us to deploy our changes to master, in this case, to production, um, as quickly as possible, then we just like squash the feedback loop, um, of releasing iterative changes of like building something 
seeing how it behaves in production, seeing how users like it, but also seeing like what error patterns it are presented from it that we didn't expect. And this, and it also really like um, makes releases non-precious, which I think is pretty interesting from a, a engineering team. Like if we have this approach where like we make a big product change every month or something, there's a lot of pent up like, um, uh, it basically can, can make, make a lot of complexities and, and like make it so that you have like a lot of pent up energy or, or like there's a lot of discussion or, uh, or like bike shedding around, um, the release that's about to go out. But if you're releasing like a dozen times a day, um, that kind of disappears and you kind of get like engineers can have autonomy. Um, they can kind of like make a change and if it was the wrong one then they can just revert it um and so i really like this this approach um so in at least the way that, that i like to operate is have like branches be meaningful so we we like you might like have like a staging branch or a naming pattern that, that anytime you make a change in, in a certain repository and push a branch with a certain name it deploys to a certain environment so staging is one example of that and then master always represents production so PRs against master get reviewed, get tested in a staging environment, and then a merge to master um, is also what releases it. Um, and I think uh, one last sort of plug that I would say of this this approach is that it, it almost is self-documenting in the same way that I was like, one of the things I love about Kubernetes is that you can, in this really declarative way, describe your running infrastructure. Um, I think merging to, to the main branch makes it so that you can kind of always reason about what is deployed, what was deployed when, when, mm. when it also makes it really easy to know, like when bugs were maybe introduced. Um, and so it kind of like provides a way for you to reason about what is deployed just by looking at the Git log, which I, I really like. Yeah. It's like a snapshot. It gives you that point in time mm -hmm. where you can go back to, if you need to and do a little time traveling. So yeah, yeah. were you, and I found also that that's like a nice thing. It's a nice thing to have in your back pocket. But as soon as you like relieve the anxiety, it also relieves anxiety where like you, you might not, we don't have to push a lot of reverts, right? Like it's easy to do when we need to, but it's also easy to just like make a new forward featuring forward facing change on top of that, which like uh, yeah. fixes the problem and makes it a little bit better. Um, so it's, it's like oh, nice to so have good. in your back pocket that you can roll back to any snapshot, but also like it's, you'll soon learn that like, you don't need to do that maybe as much as you were even expecting to. It's more just the idea that you know, if you need to, you can <laughs> do this, but uh, yeah, exactly. we usually don't need to because we the next change that we make is even better and it, it fixes this problem and exactly. it fixes another one that was on the backlog. So there's, exactly, there's something exactly. that I'm wondering about, like as I'm listening to you talk, were you originally working in DevOps and then you started working it, with machine learning when you started working at Runway? Or was it you had some experience working with machine learning before that? I, I did. I have a really weird winding history of how I <laughs> became a, an engineer and how I found myself in the place that I am. So, so I, I'm actually, I'm an artist and I taught myself how to program um, in art school. I taught myself how to program with the guidance of, you know, several uh, really awesome folks at the, the institution that I was at. Um, but it wasn't a class, it wasn't like, I, I don't have like a computer science background. I had like, truly went to art school and found some folks that were doing interesting things with, with computers and tagged along and started uh, doing interesting things as well. Um, so I, I have an arts background. That's what led me to want to compute, <laughs> led me to want to like use computing as an artistic tool. Um, at that time, I also kind of like took two branching paths in my art practice and my relationship with computers. One was like a generative um, approach. Like I was learning a lot about kind of new affordances of machines and, and how you could use machines to make new art that you've never seen before. And so that's how I fell down the ML rabbit hole. Um, so doing a lot of, this was right around the time that like GANs were coming out. Um, so doing weird kind of like feedback loop of like a, a text based model that a generative text model produces describes an image that like is produced by a generative image model, which then gets captioned by 
a, a text classification model, and then that gets re-imaged as a, a you know some other like hallucination of of a generative image model. And so these feedback loops, that's how I fell into the like ML hole. <laughs> that's how I got in, originally got interested in ML. And then also I um, am really interested in computer security and I have been for a long time. And a lot of the art that I was yeah. making was around like digital literacy to describe to folks like the current situation around um, information security and like how all of these services that we've been using in the last, um, you know, 15 20 years, um, as the web has grown up, how those things affect us from a security perspective. So I was making like security hacker art. Um, and that was like very close to the machine that was, and that's how actually how I learned like a lot of DevOps practices. Um, just cause I was making installations that I wanted people to be able to like install locally on their machines in a way where oh, wow. it's going to run on everybody's machine. That's how I found things. I, that's how I found out about Docker. Um, uh -huh. And then also wanting to make these installations where I could just like plug them in and have them boot and do exactly what I, I wanted them to do every time. So I could ship a box off to a gallery or something and it would just work. That's how I learned to do DevOps. Um, and then I worked uh, briefly at a, um, at, on the security team of a cloud computing company in Philadelphia called Linode. Um, and that's where I really learned about how DevOps meets people <laughs> um, you know, when you're not just doing quote unquote DevOps by yourself. Um, <laughs> and then I've that those sort of like that weird background of like, I'm an artist, I'm really I'm experiment with ML, but then I also have these like more hardcore and polished like engineering and DevOps um, experience and, and practices is what led me um, to be to to runway. So how much do you actually use runway? Oh, that is a great question. Um, less than you think and less than i should absolutely uh, so as an we, artist we um i think this this concept as an artist yeah so i i've never really in, in a long time been a video editor so that's one thing is like the type of tool that we were building at the beginning of runway this model zoo was i was very much the target audience of um as we've grown into making a product around video i am less of the target audience um and so that's actually been one thing that's challenging for me, I think, uh, from an engineering perspective, is like, how do I, how do I maintain empathy <laughs> in a way with the people that we're building this tool for the further I am um, from that community or, or that the types of, of folks that use that tool. Um, and so I try and use it in really like, um, meaningful ways. I don't use it in my day to day very much other than like, you know, I'm constantly have the console open and I'm like, figuring out why something doesn't work or how something could work faster, but I don't use it I, I, so much as like a normal user would. And so, um, we have these, these like internal hackathons, uh, every quarter. And so the last one, I, I actually had an entire like no code hackathon and I spent just a week making videos and, and using runway and like dog fooding it. Um, and that was a great experience. I like made a huge doc of like, here's edge cases <laughs> or things that I, that like are just like user experience hiccups, some of which I directly felt responsible for, oh, no. <laughs> you know, and like, uh, oh, no. when we were like built, when we were in some product meeting or something, deciding how the first iteration of like file upload would be. And, you know, we had to, we decided, you know, we would accept, we would take on some of these challenges and then some things we'd pick up later and then, you know, using the product and realizing like, Hey, I can't upload this collection of files in the way that I would have liked to. And then knowing, you know, I said something in a meeting at one point that made that be the case in that first iteration. It's the karma. Um, and so, the karma. exactly, yeah. And I think I think what's awesome is that, like, we have a um, an ethos at, at this company where, like, we are constantly trying to, like, understand how people are using stuff. And if we're, if we're wrong about an assumption, we just work to change it in the next iteration, you know. Mm. Um, so I think, I think to answer your question, how do I use Runway? the answer is not enough. Um, and I'm constantly trying to get better at that. You're not famous on TikTok yet, then I take it. You haven't been messing That's around. That's absolutely enough. right. Yeah. <laughs> I had to, I had to delete that app. Yeah. Too much time, <laughs> too much time down a hole. Oh, well, I want to ask you some rapid fire questions before we go. Cause I think yeah. this will be fun. And I want to start doing it with a lot of the, the guests from now on. 
What was the last book you read? Oh. Oh, this is an uninteresting question. Do I have to answer honestly? <laughs> no, but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what is um, uninteresting for you? Book about yeah, um, it was a book by Jack Bogle about about saving for retirement. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, there, let's move uh, on quickly to the next question. <laughs> I also I also read a lot of D and D books. Actually, that may actually that's a better answer. Yeah, so I I'm a DM for a, um, a Dungeons and Dragons campaign right now, and so the last book I read was a, a book preparing for that campaign. Nice. There we go. I like how you oh, changed that, that answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, tell us about the last bug you smashed. Oh, the last bug I smashed was uh there's there's a three-year-old issue with our api which was really interesting where like occasionally um we would get elevated api error rates and um we tracked down that this this is like a bug that was ha happening of how we open and close database connections that had been around since like time immemorial um where if a request failed in a good way, like a, a true 404 or a 401 because somebody wasn't authorized to do something, randomly, the next request, no matter what the endpoint, could 500. Um, which had to do with, the, I'm not going to get into the complexities of why that was, but it had to do with the way that our um, uh, API is deployed. But um, that was a really interesting question, a really interesting bug because, first off, that's a really weird behavior that, like, yeah these stateless API endpoints can have this, like, uh, cascading effect where, like, a good behaved 4xx error can randomly fail the next request with a 500, but that, I solved that last week and felt really good about it. <laughs> well, especially after three years of it probably pulling... Yeah, right? <laughs> that, uh, the takeaway from that is if you have a very, very small five, like, error rate noise floor, and I'm talking, like, uh, one in every maybe 5,000 requests or something. Um, you should still investigate why that's happening um, because it could also cause an outage in the future. Oh, that's, a, that's cool. So you being in the machine learning world, you're building machine learning tools or tools that are using machine learning. What was a piece of machine learning tooling or MLOps marketing that made you roll your eyes? Oh, most of it, I'd say. <laughs> um, that's actually one thing that I'm really proud that Runway has done in the past couple of years is we've dropped the ML from our marketing in a lot of ways. Like, mm -hmm. I think we we partially rode like the ML wave, rightfully so. Like, I think we were building really interesting technology with ML and had, you know, we if anybody had the rights to put ML in the name or to forefront the technology, I think we did. But I, I think it's, I'm really proud about how like, we're now operating in a way that is like let the product define it like don't come to the product because it's ai or mm -hmm. or ml come to the product because it's useful in your life um and i wish more companies would do that most of the mm -hmm. time i see like powered by ai or or i see like marketing that underscores the ml or the ai i roll my eyes and some of it's better than others but um, yeah, I don't know if that yeah, answers your question. There's not it's a always a flag. subway sign, just <laughs> most of them. Yeah, exactly. It's always a flag. And I hope the public feels that way. Um, being like an industry, being in the industry, everybody rolls their eyes at it, I think. Yeah. Um, and I, I hope the public catches yeah. on as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And or if the company name, it's not a dot com URL, it's a dot AI. URL. That's another one that <laughs> yeah. is always a red flag for me. So, yeah. Which part of technology or what piece of technology are you bullish on right now that might surprise people? Hmm. You already told us about Kubernetes, but what else? What's yeah. one piece that, and it could be something you're like, oh, Argo that's CD a... is saving our life. Uh, what? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's a, so, I can't make a blanket statement here. I'm just going to talk directly from my experience. There's a um, a company called Spotinst, 
Well, it's actually now called Spot by NetApp. Um, mm -hmm. They build a... Um, they're trying to build that this idea of like serverless Kubernetes, similar to, I think, Far, Fargate, AWS Fargate, this idea that like Kubernetes helped us get um, to a place where we can uh, work at an abstraction that is like a workload level and not have to think about like provisioning long lived nodes that can satisfy those workloads. I think we're now at this situation where like um, we have leveled up we're operating in a larger abstraction but eventually you still have to like think about nodes ec2 instances mm -hmm. in a way that are running your pods or your containers your workloads um and i think there's all these great toolings around like bin packing for that that kubernetes gives you out of the box but still like i'd love to destroy that abstraction and think truly at like a workload level um so something like serverless but not mm -hmm. serverless for compute in a way like not like a serverless like API or something, but more like how can I just define infrastructure at a pod level or a container level, and then I don't care what it works on, or or I, I truly care like what architecture or what like GPU devices or something it has access to, but I don't want to have to ever think about that EC2 instance. Oh, wow. um, that's what I'm bullish on. <laughs> so there's companies like Spot by NetApp that's, that's doing that. Um, there's also come like, AWS is offering this with Fargate, which I haven't used, but this idea that, like, um, Kuber a, a next step, if we all like Kubernetes, or I should say, if some of us like Kubernetes, <laughs> our next step is um, kind of, like, destroy the um, node level of Kubernetes um, and operate just at the workload level. Um, wow. That's something I'm bullish on. It's been helpful for our team, um, and who knows if that prediction is right, <laughs> and it's very specialized, but that's something I'd like to see more of. And you're already using that? You're already, like, implementing this? You're already, like, implementing this? Uh, yeah, Spot is a partner that we work with. Um, and that's, that's something cool. that we are, we are doing more of. Awesome. Well, I got one last one for you. And it's probably the deepest of all of them. How do you want to be remembered? Oh, in general. <laughs> like, at the end of days? Is that how you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um... I'd like to be remembered as somebody who cared about what they did and cared about the people they did it with. Um, I'd say that. <laughs> Great answer. Brandon, this has been super cool, man. Like, I love the three-dimensional, ten-dimensional, twenty-whatever, infinite dimensions that you have coming from being an artist, then going into security, then getting that DevOps chops and having the machine learning chops. It's just, it shines through when we talk to you. And I thank you for taking <laughs> well, the time. Well, I've really to enjoyed the conversation. It. This has been awesome, dude. Cheers, man. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for speaking with me and, and um, I really enjoyed it. <laughs>